Hello. This narration will provide a little bit more detail on each step, if necessary, and uh, I hope you find it useful. I started off with a couple of these huge cardboard tubes, which are the cores from some rolls of vinyl flooring. I found some techniques used by model rocket builders to smooth out the spiral seams in cardboard tubes. Plastic wood filler is diluted with water at no particular ratio. It needs to be just thin enough to squeeze out of a needleless syringe. That makes the application pretty precise and easier to sand smooth, but you could just spread it on too. After the tubes were painted, I chopped off those messed up ends. I used my laser cutter to very quickly make this stencil, which is much easier than vinyl stencils at the cost of a little edge bleeding. On passion projects like this though, I'm not worried about aesthetic perfection. Plus this was heading to Neotropolis and it was gonna get all messed up by sand anyway. Next, I made an angle bending jig to shape the PVC conduit cage. It's just as well the belt broke here because the radius was too large anyway. This little finger sander was more work, but it came out better. The conduit is filled with sand to prevent it from kinking when heated and bent. The sand near the bend would be heated in a toaster oven, and I also found I had to heat the outside with a heat gun. Now, heating PVC can release toxic fumes, so don't mess around with this if you don't know what you're doing. And speaking of which, I know it looks strange that I'm working vertically here. Uh, that was so gravity helped keep the sand where it needed to be, and it also gave me more room to work with the long pipe. I should have had a better fixturing system in mind, though, because each bend needed to cool for several minutes, and those clamps weren't ideal. This operation required eight bends for each of the two cages, and eventually I was unable to get the hot sand right where I wanted it. I calculated the volume required for each step, but it proved to not be very accurate, so I just ended up filling it with cold sand and heating the outside only. I don't have too many metal working tools I could press, but bending the aluminum bar in the vise worked pretty well. I must have not had the right size hole saw either, because making these holes with step bits and a file took a lot longer. But what can I say? In space, you work with what you've got. Next, I slid the bars and some 3D printed brackets over the pipe frame. The brackets were printed with a lot of extra clearance in order to round the corners, which I compensated for with another 3D printed piece. The aluminum bars were a tighter fit, so I had to sand the conduit bends a little to get them on, and I also sanded the bends just to make them look a little more round. There's no good reason for these brackets to have three nuts per side. Uh, I just thought it would look cool. This chunk of scrap metal is from some electronic appliance that I no longer recognize, and it's just there to mount some control surfaces on later on. This toggle switch is how you activate the final ignition on the missile, so of course it needs to have a safety cover. And it's just installed on a little 3D printed part, which is bolted onto the frame. These brackets will support and secure the missile to the cage. A 1 inch nylon strap would go through that little slot there in the bracket and wrap around the missile. 
This is the system control box that houses the battery and power switches. Maybe I should have painted the body and the switch cards, but looking like a prototype is lower accurate. Now I love these little LEDs that have a tiny integrated flasher chip. You just give it 3 volts and the LED flashes on its own. The circuit is very basic, just a few switches with corresponding on off LEDs. The cover panel warns that gravity and atmosphere are detected, locking out the ignition control. Because this type of missile being used can only fly in vacuum. I'm not gonna lie, the booster section of this build is kinda boring. Uh, since this is a vacuum rated missile, there are no control surfaces like you would see on an atmosphere flying missile. Stabilizing fins would have made the missile look much cooler and more recognizable as a missile, but then the project made no sense because even the most augmented soldier wouldn't be able to effectively wield a missile of this size, and making this thing stupidly big was the whole point. It only made sense as a space missile, so instead of fins it has six control thruster vents around the main thrusters. And yeah, I also just didn't want to deal with making them because they would be easy to break. Anyway, the construction of this part is pretty simple. Uh, I did like using the 3D printed jig to locate where the holes need to go. Uh, that's a very convenient part of working with digital models in conjunction with physical, you know, scratch built parts like the cardboard tube. The missile nose got a lot more detail. This particular missile model is meant for very long ranges, so it uses mostly light based guidance. That just means this thing on the front is a big camera. But I also wanted it to glow just for the rule of cool, so a pair of LEDs is reflected once off the underside of their housing, and once again off the CD that serves as the main reflector surface. I was going to cut the reflector out of gold mirror or acrylic, but a CD just happened to be the absolutely perfect size, and the re rainbow reflection looks a lot cooler too. The LEDs are powered by an external power jack because I wanted to run some wires from the control box up to the nose. This was to help show that the missile has been jerry-rigged, whereas it would usually be electronically launched from a tube on some bomber. I don't quite remember why there are two different layers for the lens there, but I think it was because I didn't want to engrave the uh, iridescent acrylic directly. And also, it looks super dusty, I know, but again, this was being unveiled in the desert, and I knew it would get all messed up anyway. And I did clean the dust off from inside the lenses. <laughs> The plan to use nylon webbing to strap the missile down didn't work at all. Instead I used some rubber S-hook straps and just hooked them on wherever I could, which actually worked better and looked better too. The wires are just duct taped to again emphasize the improvised and hacky aspect of this project. The section between the orange markings is supposed to be the payload, and I had fun with some other markings too, like the center of gravity, designated grab areas for power loaders, and a label that describes the disarm procedure in the event an armed but unexploded missile ends up somewhere it shouldn't. So this project was really fun, even though it somehow took an entire month to complete. I used a lot of different techniques and new applications of materials I already had lying around. And I knew those cardboard tubes would be useful eventually, I still have like 10 more of them. The goal was to build the largest manned portable missile launcher possible, and I think I succeeded. I wish it had stabilizing fins, but as I explained, that was unrealistic. Last, some trivia. Uh, I was originally wanting to make this a contest prize at Neotropolis, but in the end, we decided something so large would be more of a burden than a prize. Uh, if you want it anyway, one of them is theoretically for sale as of this video, but it would have to be at Neotropolis. If you enjoyed this, there's even more info on it on starsetarmory.com, and thanks for watching. <laughs>